Welcome to Student Hours. Joining me today is Dr Jill Kirby. Hello Jill. Hi Jack. How are you doing today? I'm very well. How are you? Not too bad myself. Glad to have you on. Thank you. First question I'd like to ask is if you could tell us a bit about yourself, about your background, uh, specifically before you got into teaching. Sure. Um, in fact, I always swore that I would never teach because when I was at university I did a year abroad. Um, I did history and French at university. Uh, and I did a year abroad as a language assistant in a big French lycée. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> so always said I would never teach, but it just goes to show you should never say never. What was it about teaching? Was it the idea of it you just thought it was not for you? Or? Um, oh, it was just completely unstructured. We were basically just dropped into a timetable and said, here are your classes, off you go. So right. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty difficult. Um, and also I was teaching students who were two years younger than me. I was 21, so the oldest kids in the lycée were 18 or 19. What was that like? Did it feel strange at all? Very difficult. Yeah. yeah, yeah, weird. In what way? Um, some of them had English as a mandatory class, and they didn't really want to do it. So oh, right. being faced with a room of 20 19-year-old blokes who don't want to do English was actually quite challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I really want to do it now, to be honest. So, oh. but at 21, you know, that was really, that was really difficult. So, um, but also prior to that, um, I had friends whose parents were teachers who were always kind of, oh, I don't go into teaching. So I kind of always thought I I wouldn't do it. So the irony being that teaching is one of the things that I enjoy the most now about my job. And what do you think you love about teaching the most? Oh, um, I I enjoy. Well, the obvious one that most people would say is I enjoy the light bulb moment when you see somebody get it <laughs> and there's a lot of that little ping um, and that's always brilliant. But I think it's it's the other people's perspectives. It's the, the ideas that students bring to the conversations, things that I wouldn't have thought of, getting people into discussions, getting people thinking about things that they've never thought about. Um, that's yeah, that's one of the really enjoyable bits about it. And what are the maybe not so nice bits? <laughs> the marking. Oh. I suppose that's that time of year as well, is it, for marking right now? Coming up. Oh. Coming up. Well, good luck. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, mostly everything else about it I really enjoy, but marking is, you know, it, it's because it's very fixed time periods and it's, you have to get a certain amount of it done because you're against deadlines of when they want to be able to release um, marks and feedback back to students. So it's, it's, yeah, it can be a bit of a grind if you've got a big cohort that you have to mark. Oh, so, and so before teaching then what mm, so sorry I digress oh, it's weird. All the <laughs> yeah time the uh, I wasn't going to do teaching no so actually I worked in corporate communications when I, I left university um, I didn't know what I wanted to do I actually did um, a bilingual secretarial course so like shorthand and typing and I temped for a while and then eventually ended up in the government information service, which at that point was doing press and publicity work for government departments. That's interesting. What did that involve? That was that was really interesting, actually. I worked for the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, so I know all about pigs' feet and how you're meant to house pigs in space right. <laughs> and how to transport emus by air. Um, it was all sorts of things. It was... Um, Write, writing publicity material to go to big agricultural shows. It was actually managing the stand at big agricultural shows, which was usually like uh, information that was advice for farmers, or it was information about actually things like what food and plants you can or can't back, bring back into the country if you've been abroad. Oh. Um, I remember getting going behind the scenes at, I think it was at Gatwick, to look at where we were going to place posters, which were to tell the public about what you could and couldn't bring back into the country. So how did you get into this? How did this sort of feel? I applied. Up? It was one of those things I was temping because I'd done the shorthand and typing so that I could temp and keep, you know, make a living while I looked for what I wanted to do. And I applied to the government information service as it was then. And if you got through and you had to do like, oh, like a day of assessments and things like pretend office scenario type stuff. Um, and then you'd had interviews and things. And if you got through, then it was whatever jobs were available in whichever of the government departments um, needed people. So that was how I ended up in agriculture. I wouldn't necessarily have chosen it, but actually it was a really good one to be in. It was really good fun. Oh, it seems, and okay, what was it like when you were, you described when you uh, just left uni and stuff, you were sort of unsure about what you wanted to do. Could we explore that a little bit? Because I feel like that's an incredibly common feeling amongst yeah. young people. 
uh, well, not just, just anyone to sort of figure out what they want. What was it like back then? Were you instructed more to just uh, just find a job, to find whatever comes up? Were you encouraged to look for what you really love to do? What was that time um, like? Well, I came out of uni just at the point where Britain was going into a recession, so that was really good timing. Right. Um, and I was living in London because that was where I'd been at university. My parents were up in the northeast, and I didn't really want to go back. So when I first left, <clears throat> I did the milk round. You know, the careers milk round where employers would come and re recruit graduates. They still do it to a certain extent, although it's changed a bit. And I applied to all. So I applied to British Rail as it was then. Um, as like a graduate trainee. Didn't get in. Um, which is probably just as well for Britain's railways. Um, <laughs> I ended up getting a place in an insurance company. Oh, cool. Which was a graduate entry scheme. You, the idea was you went in, you worked, and you, you did your insurance exams, and then they placed you somewhere within the insurance company. But within about two months of it, I knew I did not want to do it. It was so boring. Really? Why? Let's get it. What oh. was it? What was well, it, like? it was just, no. I, I, I don't know what I thought it would be like, but it was very bureaucratic and trying to trying to study for the insurance exams, I just couldn't do it. It just was not interested or I just not interested. Yeah. Yeah. It was just it was the wrong interestingly it was the wrong sort of studying because the pattern throughout the rest of my career was that I did I studied in nearly every job I had, either for professional exams or for stuff that I wanted to do. And that was what brought me back to academia, actually, the realisation that the thing I was enjoying in most of my jobs was the extra bit I was doing when I was studying for the qualifications and things, mm. but not the insurance qualifications. Not the insurance qualifications. They may have changed. They may be much more interesting now. Uh, and so how long were you involved in this sort of industry, these various industries, before you decided to go back to teaching or back into that world? Into how, academia. Yeah, how long was <coughs> that career for? Well, I was in the government information service for a couple of years. I then jumped across. I went into lots of places doing communications, corporate communications type work, publicity work. I worked in an, um, I worked for London Electricity. I worked um, in a PR agency, and then I joined um, one of the high street banks uh, and got into senior management. By then, I was into senior management, um, and, and it, so I had about fifteen years of working in corporate communications before I made myself redundant. Wow. We were doing some cost cutting in the bank and I was looking at the numbers and I was either gonna to have to lose two or three people um, in the, the lower grade roles. And then I looked at it and thought, but if I took myself out of the equation, I could save three jobs, practically. Hmm. And suddenly that seemed like a really good idea. Wow. So I made myself redundant. Um, and then on the back of that, that was what brought me back to Sussex. Um, somebody said, what would, you, what would you really want to do if you could do anything? Because the idea was I would go and get another job after I made myself redundant. Mm. And I said, oh, I'd go back and do history again because I always loved history. All right, could we, I wanted to break down that moment a bit more because that just sounds so interesting. So you, you see the, these jobs positions, you realise you have to fire a few people or make yourself redundant. Had there been a moment, of, period of time leading up to that though, where you, you weren't happy perhaps with yeah. your, and what was that like? What was Oh, miserable. What was what was sort of day-to-day -day life like? I mean, I'd... um I think I just I had I had been in that organization for 6 or 7 years. I knew what the score was. I, I was heading up a department. Um I I think I just got sick of doing corporate propaganda. Mm. And also, you know, I got bored a bit as well. And I had done a, a master's in organizational psychology whilst I was working, Whoa. yeah, which I wouldn't rush to do again in a hurry. That was no. pretty full on trying to work full time and study for a master's. Um, but in a way that had been a way of keeping me interested. So I did that over a couple of years and then I finished that and, and, and got the master's. And then I think I was kind of like, oh, I'm still here. Mm. And I don't really want to do more of this somewhere else. I've kind of done and I was kind head, of the head of internal communications. I kind of done it. I mean, I was being paid very well, mm. um, but you know, there comes a point when, when you realise that actually, after a certain level, that extra money doesn't make any difference. As into happiness or yeah. just a, yeah, can, can we? Um, it's 
you hear it a lot in sort of these corporate environments that basically a lot of people are quite miserable and that is it's usually pitched at least i found that you either kind of choose money and you're miserable but you kind of get over that and you accept it or you do something that maybe you're more interested in but you kind of sacrifice the money for, yeah but it uh, what do you think it really is? Do you think it's as black and white as that? Or is it... I think for some people it is, yeah. I mean, I, there were certainly colleagues that I had there who effectively felt like they were they had golden handcuffs. What do you mean by that? Sorry? Well, they had so much sort of invested in staying in the organisation because they had a really good salary. You know, maybe they had a car as one of their perks or maybe they had a subsidised mortgage, some of them had. Um, that... They could never match that somewhere else and therefore they felt they had to stay but they weren't really enjoying it necessarily and i didn't want to be i mean not only that not only did i not have all of those perks necessarily but i just didn't want to do it anymore and um i sorry to dwell on this but i think it's such an interesting topic is it um it's obviously that it's, you've said you found it quite boring and the machine's quite monotonous as well but is it is it also to do with the the, the, what you're actually doing, you, you, you weren't happy with what you're kind of producing or what work. You mentioned sort of corporate propaganda, yeah. that kind of thing. <clears throat> it was boring in a sense, but it was stressful and boring. Right. <laughs> so it's that sense of, the, you know, some of the things were quite challenging, they were quite difficult that we needed to do. Obviously, I was managing a team of people that always brings with it its own problems. Um, but I wasn't interested enough in, I guess, in the organisation and in what we were doing to overcome the stresses you know you can be really stressed doing lots of things but if you're bought into it and you're really interested in it and all the rest of it the stress doesn't really matter if you're dissatisfied or bored with something then it does matter mm. because it's so much more difficult to get past the stress or the aggravations I think I had just outgrown it but I think I had outgrown that kind of work as well I'd been doing it for a while I'd done it in different organizations um, and then I think I just needed something new, but I didn't, in corporate terms, I didn't know what else that new thing would be, because right. I did sort of look around within the organisation um, and looked at other places. And actually, after I made myself redundant, there was a gap before I did the Masters where I went and did some consultancy work, which was very different. You know, you were effectively selling your skills to other corporate entities, etc. Um, and that was interesting, but it was kind of more of the same. And that was when I thought, no, I'll... I'll give myself a year off, I've got the redundancy money, I'll go and do a master's, because I've always wanted to go back to history, and then I'll get a real job again. Right, well, the word real job, this is the Yeah, exactly. And the, that's really, um, that, those feelings of feeling um, yeah, unhappy and all these kind of things, do you think they kind of slowly grind on you and creep up over time? And it's when you first start, obviously, when you, you kind of, then you're being paid very well, that can kind of quite ease that pain quite quickly. But then it's like over time, does it slowly build up? Yeah, and I mean, you spend money to cheer yourself up as well. Right. So Waterston did really well out of me because there was one just across the road from, from where I was working. And yeah, so at lunchtime I'd go and buy books because, okay, books are an escape. <laughs> you know, there, there were some clues there, I think, that I probably should have picked up on earlier. You know, so therefore you're spending the money to try and cheer yourself up. But that's kind of a vicious circle because mm. you're still doing the thing. And I actually, I had great colleagues. I had really lovely colleagues. I really liked most of the people that I was working with on a day-to-day -day basis. It wasn't horrible in that sense. Um, there was some really serious stress towards the end because there was some political stuff going on within the organisation that I got caught in the middle of. Um, and that was all a bit unpleasant. But I think it was just the nature. I think it had run its cycle. You know, I'd been in communication since the early 90s. By this time we're in the noughties. I'd kind of done it and I the other bit of the job that I could have gone into, which would have been the more press and media related side, I didn't want to do. Why? Oh, I didn't want to have to mess with the press, basically. No. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um I'd seen how intrusive that could be at a senior level, a colleague who was the, the head of media for the organisation. You know, she'd get calls on Christmas Day from journalists. Oh my God. And I was just like, no, I want to, at that point, I was just like, no, I want my home life mm. here and my work life there. I don't want that crossover. And yeah, out of interest as well, when you were working in that environment, did you f feel like you were able to still have that kind of personal balance as well? Or did it 
take over your personal life quite a lot. I well. was really protective of the of that balance, and I was very protective of it with my team as well. I always said to them, I think it's really important that you stop work, mm. and you go away and you think about other things and you do other stuff because actually. That doesn't mean that it's not all still going on in your subconscious. I say this to students as well. It doesn't mean the work's not happening still. In fact, you need that downtime to let your brain process stuff. Mm. If you're sitting working, answering emails at 11 o'clock at night, where's your downtime that you're letting yourself refresh? Mm. You'll burn yourself out if you work like that. So I was. there were two things that were really good. One was I, I kept very strict boundaries and I was commuting, had a good hour and a bit commute to get home. So I had that kind of... Downtime. Segway, yeah. yeah. Also, at that time, um, the mobile signal where I lived was really rubbish. <laughs> so actually, no one can find you. So, so, but no, what was interesting, it was always clear to my staff that if they needed to, they could call me, but they'd have to call me on the landline. And there was obviously some sort of psychological barrier whereby people are having to call your mobile, mm. but they were much more hesitant to call the landline. So actually, I rarely got called at home. That's really interesting. <laughs> I think it would be different now because people are so much more used to just using mobile phones all the time. At that point in the early noughties, it was still a bit more um, unusual, I suppose. Yeah, well, nowadays, it's like, what's your excuse? It's just like, yeah, yeah I mean, so people just don't even use that. Just avoiding me. Yeah, just... Exactly, but at that time, yeah, the, the net network coverage really was quite poor, so I couldn't have, I wouldn't have picked up any messages on the mobile anyway. <laughs> but I was really, and, and I still do it to this day, I'm still quite strict about, I, I really strongly feel that you need to have boundaries between work and non-work. Mm. Um, and lots of, yeah, if you read lots of psychologists, they will say the same. You need to have that downtime to go back fresh. Absolutely, because also if, if you are doing that approach of answering emails or phone calls at 11, you're probably not, going to be in your best mind anyway no, no. so it would affect your work like more isn't always more and no i mean it depends i've got colleagues who i know work really effectively in the evenings that just doesn't work for me yeah well, yeah whatever so, works so you know. know in terms of some people are not morning people actually i'm not sure i'm a morning person either so there's obviously a really small window of opportunity <laughs> 12 o'clock in, in my working day yeah about lunchtime um but i i think you need i think you need to be aware of it and so actually when i look back from quite early on in my career I was quite protective of this is work time, this is not work time. Mm. Even if in the not work time I was actually studying for a master's or right. before that I was doing PR qualifications and, and other stuff. Yeah. That's good, maybe just on the, on the flip side as well of the whole discussion we've been going on. It's good that, that you said that because it means it breaks down that myth as well that if you're in the corporate life all you do is consume work, like you can still find the balance and get it, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's yeah, and you can do the thing you want to do. You know, I couldn't, mm. I wouldn't have done that masters if I hadn't enjoyed it. It was bloody hard. It really mm. was hard work because a lot of it was stuff I hadn't done psychology as a degree, so a lot of it was really challenging new ideas. I did a statistics module for like a whole term, which I'm still stunned that I got through it. Um, so it was actually really intellectually challenging. But in a way, I think that was good because it was a different kind of challenging to the day-to-day -day work challenging, mm. if you see what I mean. So for me, that balance worked, although, as I say, I wouldn't rush again to do full-time study, well, part-time study or full-time work. Right, and so at that point, you decided to make the big decision to leave and mm -hmm. look for something else. What was that moment like? Can you remember in terms of the challenges you faced in doing, or if any, that you faced in doing so? And did you feel much judgment at all from either yeah. friends or colleagues or...? When I decided, when I did the making myself redundant thing, um, yeah, some people were really surprised. Um, and, and one colleague in particular said to me, you shouldn't do this. This is the point in your career when you should be maximizing your earnings. You know, you can go back and do a master's in history when you retire, mm. why would you leave now? And I, it quite, that kind of shook me a bit. But I also thought, yeah, and I could get knocked over by a bus next year, and how cheesed off will I be that I've spent my time doing a job that I didn't enjoy? Mm. And here's something that I'd like to do, and I've got a chance to do it. And at that point, I was still only thinking I was going to do the Masters for a year, and then I was going to go back into corporate life somewhere. Um, but th there was definitely a sense of judgment there. Otherwise, no. I mean, people like my family, my partner, my parents were all really supportive they were just like yeah you're clearly not happy what you're doing <laughs> do something else mm. that's interesting how many obviously we can't say this for certain but out of interest how many people do you think in terms of fellow colleagues you may have worked with secretly would have wanted to do the same thing that you did but maybe you were a bit 
fearful of doing that and taking the risk. Oh, I think they're probably were colleagues. I mean, I was lucky in some respects in that I don't have kids, so I didn't have immediate priorities. immediate responsibilities, yeah. which I think a lot of other colleagues who perhaps would have liked to have done something similar had to think about the family and about that. Um, I was, yeah, I think I probably was the main breadwinner in, in, in my partner and my home, but he was okay with us living on beans for a couple of years, if we had to live on beans for a couple of years, um, you know, if the redundancy money didn't last. Um, because again, his view was, I'd rather you were doing something that made you happy. It's funny because I think it sounds so normal and nice when you, when you said it, but I don't think it's that common. I feel like most people don't choose that option. I don't, I don't, most think, people, I don't think most yeah. people do. I think it's hard to do. Uh, yeah. you know, and I'm making it sound like it was easy. It wasn't. It built up over a long time, me thinking about it. And as I say, I came to Sussex to do the Masters, still seriously thinking I was, I was having a year off, basically. Mm -hmm. And then I would go back into another profession corporate life right. and find something else. I mean, I went and talked to headhunters and I, I had lots of network contacts. I talked to different people. I went and saw careers advisors. I think I got, actually I got careers advisor and stuff as part of my redundancy package. I did that, I filled in all these psychometric tests that tell you what you should do. And none of them came to anything that was really conclusively different to what I'd been doing. Well, that would just be quite depressing. I think my I dad just did didn't one want to do that. Got, yeah, I think my dad did one of those once. I hope doesn't mind me saying this. I think he got like grave digger or like something. Oh, so, good, so yeah. yeah. So <laughs> my initial when I was at, at London University as an undergraduate, they had a, a nascent career centre and they had this amazing computerised careers advice thing, and you filled it all in. And mine basically said, fast food manager. Right. And I was so unimpressed at that yeah. result that I don't think I ever went back to the careers. Uh, Where dreams again. are narrowed down. I just, I was just like, no, yeah. on what planet do you think mm. I'd be good at customer service? Um, <laughs> and dealing with loads of kids, no. But so um, what was that transition like then between leaving and then, were, were you sort of scared at all? Were yeah. You, yeah. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was really scared. Um, I was really scared about the finances. I had the redund I had some redundancy money, so I was able to pay my fees, and I had worked out enough money to live, and all the rest of it. Um, but you know, we did have to budget, um, and we had a mortgage to pay, which we had gone into when I had been earning lots of money um, previously. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I was nervous, and there was anxiety. But at the same time, there was also a strong sense that I couldn't, I couldn't keep doing what I'd been doing. Mm. that I had to do something different because I was depressed I mean at one point I was really depressed um, which links to the stress actually stuff later on because when I went to see the doctor the doctor told me that I was stressed not depressed mm. and I thought I was depressed so which was one of the things that I was then curious about what's the difference and how do you decide and you know what difference does that make which of those I say I am mm. versus what a doctor might say I am um, so, so I, I don't think it's necessarily easy to do that whole career change thing, and I think it takes time where you start to think about it over a longer, you know, quite a long period. But ultimately, for me, I had to do something different because mm. it was making me too unhappy to do what I'd been doing. Mm. I mean, it's, it's it's amazing that you did it. It's, I do. Th I think yeah, fear. I think in particular, and mm. obviously, understandably, fear for people with different circumstances. But they've refused to do that, and I think. I think I've met people sometimes perhaps later in life who you can see the, the kind of regret, if you like, the, the kind of emptiness sometimes. So I, I think it's amazing because it's very brave and it's fantastic. It's obviously worked out very well. So Well, at the time, yeah. I didn't think it was brave, etc., because I didn't realise I wasn't going to go back into the corporate world. <laughs> right. So I was going <laughs> I thought, next door. Just I thought to... I was just doing a year to do a master's and then I was <laughs> going to... So it was only when I did that year of the master's and then it was like, OK, what happens now? And then I spent a year doing little bits of consultancy and I, and I had qualified as a coach. So I did coaching with people, you know, sort of business coaching and life coaching. Um, but I was still connected to the university. I did, I did like some part-time jobs and project jobs and things at the university. And it was only after that, that I actually got included in a grant bid that Lucy Robinson was doing with somebody else in psychology. Um, they were, they were creating a big grant bid and part of that was a PhD place and I was the person that was going to do that PhD. Uh, ultimately they didn't get the grant 
but by that time I was sold on the idea of doing the PhD. Mm. Um, which then meant that I had to find a way to finance my way through that. There was a tiny bit of redundancy money left, but not much. So actually, although I did my PhD full time until the very end, I actually worked part time while I was doing it. And I was teaching management in a further education college mm. on a part time basis. What was that? What was that time in your life like? Was it very stressful? Was there just a lot going on? Um, it was interesting because there I was teaching when I'd always said I wouldn't teach, mm. and teaching adults and some of them professionals working in all sorts of different um, industries. Um, the management stuff was fine because I'd done that. I'd done it in practice, but I also knew the theory because I'd done that as part of my organisational psychology masters. And actually, I really enjoyed the teaching. I think that was what then effectively opened the door. When I, when I came back to Sussex as a PhD and then obviously got to do some teaching as a PhD student. But it was like, yeah, this is actually something that I quite enjoy. Sort of like a happy accident almost. Yeah, really. It's, yeah. It's, it's, I've heard that said so many times that often when people end up in professions that they really love and really enjoy, it's always kind of by accident or, or not the obvious thing that they would have thought. And it's just by doing, I suppose, loads of different things and then you end up in certain situations. You find out. No, find exactly. It, yeah. I mean, I was teaching management stuff. I wasn't teaching history. But actually that was quite interesting because people came from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, I look back now and think, now that I've been teaching for longer and I've done teaching qualifications, ooh, they must have had a bit of an interesting experience because <laughs> I was effectively an untrained teacher doing that. But obviously it worked well enough that, hmm. that, that, that I was, you know, A, they kept employing me and B, the students were obviously getting on with the, the management qualifications they had to do. Yeah, maybe to conclude that sort of chapter, mm -hmm. do you think what would be your advice to anybody out there right now who's thinking about maybe changing careers, whatever that may be, but who are perhaps a bit nervous or fearful, what advice would you give for them? I think I'd say do it. I mean, it took me a long time and I was very fearful and very, very nervous. But I also look back at when I left university originally. And I think if I had been less fearful, I might have stayed on at that point. I all, effectively, I think I've always been an academic. I've just kind of veered into corporate life for sort of 15, 16, 17 years. Um, but the thing that wouldn't, that I would never have even considered doing it, because I did have a friend who did a PhD um, at the time, was I was too afraid of not being able to live. You know, mm. how, how will I have money? How will I keep myself? And, and again, it was a recession period. Right. Um, so I think fear and anxiety can stop you and obviously the, that they were good things to be afraid of they were sensible things to be afraid of um, but I think now I look back I think there would have been ways of working around that mm. but a, I also think take all the advice that you can from things like career services I know I just took the mickey out of London University's career service telling me to be a fast food manager but actually what I didn't get when I left university because it just wasn't really there or it wasn't there obviously enough I didn't really get very good advice hmm. why not why do, why do you think I just it, don't think it was there I think there was an expectation that you joined you did the milk round like I say or you went into different professions I actually think it would have been really helpful if somebody had sat down with me and said actually you know based on your degree have you thought about staying on and doing your masters right. but nobody did hmm. that's interesting I think well, yeah my my dad talks about say he would He'd never really got advice like that either. It was, it was very much I don't know, quite similar to you, I think, in that respect, just sort of going into what, what was available. You just sort of that expect, kind of yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's kind of what I did. I went into what was available because who goes into insurance because they want to go into insurance? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that might be the rare person, but um, yeah, and you might end up in insurance because you want to go in HR or you really mm. like selling things or whatever, but it's kind of like, you know, no, the dream. no kid's yeah, five year old aspiration is, oh, I want to work in insurance, daddy. Um, well, if they are, good luck to them. If they're, uh, I mean, well, quite, and if it is, yes, that's <laughs> great because we need people to work in insurance. But um, yeah, I did it because it, it was a job, basically. Mm. That's interesting. And so let's talk about the first time you got involved into teaching and what was that like? Because I've seen you've written and worked involved in imposter syndrome and academia mm. in, in general. And what was, could you talk a bit about that, please? And what was that yeah. like? So as part of my PhD, I, I taught here at Sussex. Um, um, I taught on various different modules, um, on third year final subjects and on first year stuff, etc. 
Um, and that was fine because I had the experience of having taught the management stuff in further education. In fact, at some points I was doing it simultaneously. I was teaching at Sussex higher education and also teaching the further education stuff. Um, I was also teaching in other institutions as well at various points during my PhD. So I was getting lots of really varied teaching experience. It was completely different to how I would have expected it back in France in the 1980s when I said I would never teach because of course it was different. I was older, I had more experience, but also it was more structured. You know what you've got to teach. There's a syllabus, there's you know, a module outline, there's a set of readings and you know all the rest of it that's, that's built into it. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh, it's and as simple as that, really. <laughs> well, well, fantastic. But in terms of imposter syndrome, I've seen you yes, write sorry. about it. No, that's all right. I was just wondering if you could speak about that. Is that something that you think is quite common in the world of academia at all that people yeah. experience? Could you describe that, please, what that is? Yeah, so imposter syndrome, I mean, it's not unique to, uh, to academia, and no. I think I felt it in my corporate life as well, but it's that sense that in a minute they're going to catch me out. They're going to realise that I don't really know what I'm doing. Mm. And it's dead common. It's dead common across loads of different places. But the research that I did a few years ago with a few colleagues here at Sussex was particularly about kind of early career um, academics and particularly early career academics that came from uh, not middle class backgrounds, basically, working class backgrounds right. or um, ethnic backgrounds. So kind of not not your classic come from a middle class family, become a middle class academic, etc. Mm. And I know, I know not everybody is at all, and particularly at Sussex there's quite a lot of variety. But I think there are some things when you're first generation from a working class or a very low middle class background, that you don't have <clears throat> the cultural capital. And I think that's, you know, that's why I didn't get good advice when I left my degree, because I didn't realise it was an option to mm. stay on and do more study, because I didn't know of anybody who'd done that. My parents didn't know, my parents didn't go to university. That, that kind of thing that we we realise, and lots of people do research on it, that is actually really important to your experience of university. And if you don't have that cultural capital, there's often quite a lot of things that you miss. So that sort of cohort of early career researchers and early career academics often suffer from imposter syndrome. Um, and it is, it's, it's this sense of not really knowing what you're doing when actually you do. And some of it is, and this was what we were writing about in the research piece that we did, is sort of institutional. So it's the way that junior staff are treated, or early career staff are treated, often reinforces those sense of imposterism. So it will be that you're asked to do really quite challenging things, but you're not really given the support or the resources to do them. Mm. Um, it's getting better, but sort of, eight, ten years ago when we were working on that piece, amongst the group of us, there were about six of us writing it, we had all had experiences of being asked to do stuff and doing stuff that then made us feel like imposters because we didn't have the support or the resources to do it. Um, or we were dismissed by more senior people in ways, and treated by more senior people in ways that made us feel smaller. Do you have any examples you could give of that? Um, sort of things I mean obviously being talked over in meetings and things is a classic it's also a classic experience of women generally and minorities generally um, but it's not always gendered or, or, or based on race um, I can't think of specifics I'm trying to think of things that colleagues talked about I mean colleagues talked about doing work and then somebody else taking the credit for it which is a classic one mm. if you work in partnership with somebody more senior that the senior person puts their name on it even though you did most of the legwork that hasn't been my experience, but other people had had that. So that would be the kind of thing that would contribute. It sounds like, would it be fair sometimes as well, as often that it was little things that you can't always give explicitly call out. It's almost like a, a way you're that you're made to be yeah, to yeah, feel. It's not it. overt displays of you're beneath me, but it's a tone. It's like a, yeah. all right, it sounds like a way of looking. That's, just, that's unfortunate to hear. How, how often, or how much rather do you think of that is quite deliberate, like it's quite an old kind of culture? Because I do think, personally, I think um, I think Sussex is brilliant and sort of differentiates a lot from this. That was my experience at least. I do think in a lot of the world of academia, that's quite a broad term, but I, 
I feel like the vibe past in there is deliberately designed or there is real structures to kind of be imposing and make you feel sort of inferior or just lucky to be there, lucky to be involved. And there is a lot of sort of seniority. I feel like these questions are only starting to be discussed in sort of recent years. And that's to do on all sort of levels, whether to do like the, um, the backgrounds of your staff or of what's taught in the curriculum. But as you said, then there are also these other sort of smaller details of how people are taught. How, how much of that do you think is quite deep rooted and systemic and deliberate rather than just kind of coincidence? It's, I think it's deep rooted and systemic. I think it is often institutionalised in the practices of institutions. And I'm not just talking about universities now, it's also true in other institutions. How much that's deliberate, I suppose, depends on how much those institutions are prepared to recognise that those things exist and change them. Mm. If they're not prepared to recognise them and change them, then I think it is deliberate. Otherwise, some of it is, as a historian, it's his, it's history, isn't it? It's how those institutions have developed, what the culture was as they evolved, and whether that culture has kept up with what else is happening in society or not. I mean, an example would be something that I thought was really interesting. I was talking to a, a really quite senior colleague um, last year sometime, and they mentioned having gone to um, some academic event at one of the Oxbridge colleges, mm. a part of which there was a dinner, and they weren't aware that when the port comes round, you pass the port to the left. Right. So the bottle of port appears on the table after the dinner, when you're having your crackers and cheese or whatever, and the idea is when it comes round, it always gets passed to the left. I have no idea why that is. How do I know that? I've read it in a novel or something. You know, <laughs> I, I, it's not that I've, you know, I've never experienced it, I don't think. And they said, oh, you know, they were made to feel really embarrassed because they didn't know that. I mean, you could argue that's almost why it's a thing. There's, there's no other reason for it. It's to, it's to, and that just is to let you know yeah, an who's in the know. An just a way to thing. point yourself yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Oh. But, but when they said that, I thought, yeah, that's really interesting. That's one of those classic examples. Now, I'm not sure that you would see that at Sussex. This is an Oxbridge College, so, you know, very traditional, etc. And there is a whole kind of etiquette around how those kind of Oxbridge dinners and things work I'm sure mm. um, but I think yeah I think it depends on the institution how much there's a sense that it's deliberate and how much it's kind of something that is evolving and that institutions can do something about to try and, and, and weed it out you know it's the same thing about, about how difficult the culture is for non-white people we have these discussions about students and belonging how can you make people feel like they belong in a place where they don't see other people like themselves Mm. or they're not taught by other people like themselves you know and, and that's that's an ongoing thing that institutions across the country but Sussex is definitely wrestling with in terms of how we can change so that applies both to student bodies and to faculty as well yeah and I, I suppose also just to broader to society as well these are kind of conversations that you're at least starting to see in mainstream media have a bit more I mean yeah it's another issue in itself mm. but um uh, what began your interest in history then, specifically as a subject you wanted to go into? I can't remember a time when I didn't like history. My dad always liked history. My dad had lots of history books and novels, sort of historical novels and things. Um, and we did the, you know, we lived in, in the North East. The, the Roman War is, was literally, the Roman War was literally on the edge of my high school. Wow. It was the ditch, the vallum of the Roman Wall was part of the grounds of my high school. You can see bits of the Roman Wall on the West Road of Newcastle where I used to go backwards and forwards into town and into school. So history was right there. So I, I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it at school. And I had a totally and utterly fantastic history teacher at A-level who was a true eccentric. <laughs> he had... Um, a small holding in very rural North Northumberland, so we had a really long drive into the school every day. He stomped around with a pipe and a deerstalker hat on, and was one of those people, inspirational teachers who, I mean, my classmates used to say, get him talking, get him talking, Jim, you can always ask him a good question. But if you got him talking, it was really interesting because he had, he had really interesting stuff to tell us about, and his take on history was, was really interesting. And, and he became a kind of mentor to me. Um, so that sparked even more interest in history for me. Oh, but I think that's so essential to have interest in teachers, particularly at A-level, because 
90% of the time, I think when you speak to people, if they're not interested in history, it's usually because they've had a really boring teacher at a, or just from as early back as you can go. And I always think the way it's taught from the early years, it's usually, it's a memory test, really. It's not, yeah. it's, it's or just yeah. focusing on memorising the dates, which, by the way, I, I feel like they've become almost less important the higher you actually get up, and it's more about making more interesting arguments. Why so shouldn't we is... start with that, anyway, <laughs> for this whole other conversation? No, but I'm going to give you a look. At A-level, I had two history teachers. I had him. I had another um, female history teacher. And you could have died of boredom in her classes, bless her. They, you know, it really was deeply prejudiced to people in content as far as I was concerned as well. But <laughs> that's by the by. I'm not going to say what it was to insult other colleagues who work <laughs> on those periods. But um, so, you know, the contrast between her classes, which were like deathly, and his, which were really brilliant, was really stark. Um, but I liked it enough that, you know, you could get through the boring bits in order to get to the more interesting stuff. Mm. Um, and also, what was interesting about him, and maybe this goes back to inspirational teachers, was that he never treated us, me and the other A-level students, as kids. He treated us as adults, mm. which in that school institutional environment isn't always the case, even at sixth form. No, it's quite often. Quite often you're still treated yeah. like kids, uh, and mm. he didn't. Um, now, some of the things that he did, I don't think he'd get away with now. So he, ran, he ran the debating society in my school, and it was just an ordinary comprehensive school, um, quite a rough comprehensive school, actually. And I was in the debating society, and there were a couple of other people. And we had to debate something about guns, so he brought his shotgun in for me to, for me to wave at one point during one of the debates. Pretty sure you wouldn't get away with that now. <laughs> I mean, obviously it wasn't loaded, but even well, so. Well, you just... <laughs> yeah, you definitely wouldn't get away with that now. God, the, the characters like that are essential. I feel like they're dying out of those kinds of characters, I feel like you don't know, hear of the eccentric as much anymore. I know, he was brilliant. He'd been, he'd been the um, NUS entertainments officer when he was at, at university in London. I'd have met Jimi Hendrix because they what? booked him to play their union. Oh my God. <laughs> I know, so we had like all these amazing kind of bits of eccentric life experience that were just, to us, we were like, oh my God, really? What was he like? Let's see if we can try and find him after this and see what's happening. I know, do you know what? I'm really, really sad that I've lost touch with him and I know he's still around because I, I saw his name in something, he's, I think he's retired now, um, to do with the Oral History Society, but I have failed to track down an email to get in touch with him because I would love to get back in touch with him again because mm. he was such an important influence. And I mean, he became friends with my parents, he came and had dinner with my parents oh. and stuff as well. We looked after one of his goats when, it, when the goats were... One we of had, his goats, We had yeah. a, a kid goat live in our garage for like three or four weeks in suburban Newcastle. Wow. And it got, it went, it sat in the back garden and ate the grass and all the neighbours in the surrounding houses all had a good look in the back garden and went, we've got a goat in the garden. <laughs> so yeah, his eccentricity was, was, was catching. Oh. And uh, so what areas of history did you first specialise in then? So when I, when, I, when I was at university for my undergraduate degree, the two bits of my degree that I most enjoyed and that I most remember and probably still think about now was I did a special subject in the history of madness Whoa. with a historian called Roy Porter, who's now died, but was a really, and again, an, another sort of slightly eccentric, but also very inspirational. Um, historian um, and that was brilliant that was fascinating it was quite early days in terms of the research into the treatment of the mad and of lunacy That's so um, some of it was quite cutting-edge stuff that he was teaching us um, and it was also a course that was open to all the colleges of London University when it used to be a much more collegiate university so there was me and one other person from my college people from Royal Holloway people from I don't know Kings, UCL, all different places. So it was also quite a mixing pot as a, as a course. And the other one was a French course that I did because I did a joint honours degree, which was about modern French, it's called something like modern French thought, um, which was feminism, it was oh my, postmodernism, it was all the isms. And it was difficult, challenging intellectual stuff. I still don't get some of it. Um, but those two things were kind of really fascinating it's an interesting combination and challenging sure. at the same yeah. time yeah they, they, were, were they happening in the same year no the french thought one was in my last year that the madness was in my second year but um so so that got me interested in mental health and history mm. and that kind of stayed buried as a little thread that when i came to sussex and i did the masters um 
I did one special paper which was about household medicine before the NHS. So like home, so rem home remedies, home right? remedies what, people, what people did themselves because it was expensive to pay for formal medicine, etc. Mm -hmm. And then I did another special paper on PTSD in the Falklands War. And that got me interested in stress, but also this that, that understanding of the politics of diagnosis. Mm. And you know, PTSD is a political diagnosis. It comes at it appears as a diagnosis at a particular time and in a particular place linked to the Vietnam War. Um, and in fact, it doesn't get recognised in Britain until after the Falklands War as a diagnosis. So that got me, I was intrigued by that. What do you think, um, obviously I know it's extremely interesting, obviously, but what specifically do you think interested you about that? Um, I think, I, I mean, going back to the madness thing, I've always been interested in kind of the history of medicine. But what got me interested particularly in the PTSD stuff was the sources that I used. I went to the Imperial War Museum and I listened to oral history tapes of Falklands veterans mm -hmm. talking about their experiences and, and in some cases talking about their PTSD, whether diagnosed or not diagnosed. Um, I did have a big cry in the archive at some of those because they were very moving. And I think it was that the, the non-formal side of medical history, so people's experiences mm. of health or illness, as opposed to what do the doctors say and what's the kind of, you know, what's the dates version of history if we look at um, medicine or look at things like mental health or stress. Um, that got me interested in ordinary people's experience. And I had also come to Sussex to do my master's degree deliberately because of mass observation. I wanted to be able to get my hands on the mass observation archive. I'd read about it somewhere and it just sounded really brilliant. And for those who don't know, do you want to explain what the mass yeah, observation, mass observation archive, archive is? Yeah, mass observation archive is, the original thing was set up in the 1930s and it was an anthropology of ourselves. So it was a bunch of people who wanted to study what ordinary Britons thought and felt in a way that you would usually apply to some kind of far-flung tribe in somewhere exotic. Um, and so they invited people to be volunteers, to write diaries, to respond to questions, to submit stuff, to listen in on conversations on buses. And it went all the way through the 1930s, right up to the end of the 1950s, when it kind of petered out. Um, but it was restarted in 1981 and it's still going now. So there are kind of two phases to it. And I've been lucky enough to use both in the research that I've done. And it's all ordinary, I put ordinary in inverted commas, it's ordinary people, they're not ordinary because they volunteer to tell people stuff right. as part of an archive, but ordinary in the sense of they're people whose voices are not necessarily heard elsewhere. Um, and it's brilliant, people write all sorts of weird and wonderful and really personal stuff in the archive, so it's an absolute gift for researchers. I feel like there's so much to unpack. Like there's so much interesting. Thing, <laughs> no, there's so many interesting topics oh, here that I can go in like twenty different directions. To be honest, but I want to try to keep relatively okay. focused. But what did there any, did you hear anything that kind of I suppose caught you off guard or surprised you when you heard some of the uh, tapes from the veterans from the Falklands? Oh, um, good question. I'm not sure that I heard anything that surprised me because I had read quite a lot about PTSD by then. Um, I suppose I was caught off guard in the sense that I hadn't expected to sit and cry in an archive with other people sitting around. Um, but it was you know, the nature of what was... It wasn't even that it was necessary that they were telling me something sad on the tape. It was more the appreciation of that person's experience, mm. you know, and the, and the difficulties or the sadness of whatever it was they were going through. Um, I mean, the other thing that always occurs to me is when, I, when, I, when I'm in an archive, if I'm sitting in the mass observation archive and I'm reading somebody's, again, sometimes really sad, sometimes really funny or, or really poignant stuff, I sometimes have to pinch myself and, say, and remember, this is my job now. And I and compare to how awful I felt about my corporate job at the end of it, when I was desperate to leave and, you know, as I've talked about earlier um, and then it's you know it's amazing you, you can have a job where this is one of the things that you do is read this stuff that people have told us about themselves and their history in the past. I think it's amazing as well to to put 
it must have been to hear real people. It, it's very different from just reading numbers on a page to actually hearing someone tell it from their own perspective. It's yeah. It's one of the most remarkable things about archives, I think, is that you can really find you can hold a piece or directly listen into a piece of history and really bring it to life. And I think that does just make it more impactful and can help with our own empathy and understanding. And because I do feel like sometimes some events or horrible things that happen, they can easily get overlooked or, or not maybe treated with as seriously as they perhaps should be because they're kind of overlooked and we're just used to hearing of them as statistics or numbers. But it's easy to figure out they are just people as well. And uh, mm. that's, yeah, it's an amazing side of history, I think. And yeah, one of the things that, that makes your job very fun and interesting and rewarding. Yeah. But yeah, and um, so stress was one of the areas that you just yeah. decided to specialise in. Uh, I understand it was more to sort of the late twentieth century in Britain that you focused on, or is that later on? Did you did you start? Yeah, no. I mean, well, it started off originally. It was the PTSD stuff, which right. obviously was yeah. late twentieth century because it only appears sort of um, in the late seventies as a diagnosis. Um, but then that kind of got broadened out because a they didn't get the grant and I didn't get the PhD place as part of the grant, in which case it was up to me to set the parameters of what my research would be. And so I decided to look much more broadly, so across the whole 20th century, and to look at stress again from that ordinary person's point of view, not from the kind of, here's what the history of medical diagnoses are. Uh, obviously that plays a little, that plays a part because you need to understand where it came from. Um, but, and then it was being led by the sources that I could find and you know what archives were available and what material was available because how do you find out material about mental health that for great swathes of time has been a stigmatised thing that nobody wants to talk about? Hmm. So it was the challenge of finding sources um, that then kind of got me go going into it because that became fascinating. That's interesting. And one of the things I read that I found particularly interesting was that you mentioned that stress just as a concept is actually quite a relatively new thing, am I right in saying that? Yeah. And so that obviously links into PTSD in, in the sense of the limited understanding of mental health and that, that kind of thing until well after the, the various wars. Could you explain then, so how, how did stress come, become so prominent as a term that was used sure. in the sort of 70s, 80s, 90s? Yeah, I mean... The experiences that we might think of as stressful now, that, you know, trying to catch a train or being late for something or having to do an exam, those feelings still existed in the past. They just didn't have the label of stress. What people tended to talk about, um, in, particularly in the 20th century, but also earlier actually, was nerves. Mm. Having trouble with your nerves. He can't hold his nerve, that kind of thing. Or being nervous. Oh, she's a really nervy woman. I remember hearing my mum say that about somebody, um, you know, or, or, or nervous breakdowns, mm. Talk, which is a fantastic phrase because it's so imprecise and unspecific. One person's nervous breakdown is somebody else's slightly bad day, you know, mm. it's, it's that kind of vagueness. And that was one of the other things that got me really interested was this vagueness of some terminology. I mean, what is stress? The things that stress you will be probably very different to the things that stress me. And sometimes things will stress me on one occasion, but not on another. Mm. So it's kind of all contextual. Um, and so that was, that was sort of what, what got me fascinated in stress. When you look at the, when, when the switch happens, if you like, from people talking about nerves and stuff, it really sort of comes about in the late 1950s. Um, there's a research, researcher called Hans Seeley in Canada. He's a uh, European immigrant. Um, and he's, his research looks at um, the idea of stasis, of things staying balanced. He's doing this research in the sort of 30s before the war and it develops and he develops this theory that the body has a response to stressors, so things that inflict stress, that might be heat or cold or all those sorts of factors, but not just that it has a response, that that response itself is stress. He wasn't the only one working on it, there were other people at the time, but he particularly, he wrote a book and then he was very good at publicising that book and then self-publicising afterwards. So stress as a condition, as a thing that you might get, becomes an idea in the late 50s that's picked up on and popularised very quickly, partly because Celia's very good at self-publicity, but also 
because there are a couple of sort of large interested parties for whom stress is a useful idea. One is the military, who are really keen to understand how they can um, help soldiers, airmen, etc., not be stressed mm. or to deal with stress. So there's work done during the during the war by a bloke called Grinker, looking at airmen particularly and about people in combat under stress. What can the military do to mitigate that stress to keep their soldiers fighting, basically? That's really, it's, really, it's, it's fascinating you say that because I remember learning about a particular military doctrine that was used in Russia in the sort of 1850s. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was about that kind of thing, but it was about trying to train soldiers to harness, it was str like stress and fear, but learn to how to harness it and then sort of put it into put fighting. It into and it was this kind of mentality that they had, whilst they didn't have the technolog technological um, advantage, they had the superior mentality, which made the kind of like Russian soldiers, but I know it's a bit of a weird time to talk about that. Mm. But it's really interesting, this, this um, the theory that goes into understanding stress and, and fear, all these kind of things. But if you think about it, it's always been there because fighting has always been By its really definition, horrible. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, really horrible. And people have been really afraid. And you've also had people who give up or, you know, run away understandably in my opinion um so it's always been a thing and there have been different bits of terminology you know you go back into the 19th century and uh this is syndrome the soldier's heart where they think that the heart gets overstrained in in battle um and then obviously you get um the first world war and you get the hysteria and the all those things related to to um to what happens to people um and you know the whole idea of shell shock so so there's a kind of pattern particularly from the military so the military are really interested and of course it's the cold war period the late 50s early 60s so the military put quite a lot of money into research into stress which obviously then helps to make it a thing at the same time industry are really interested in stress as well because they see that some workers don't cope with work as well as others mm. this is where i have a personal interest obviously <laughs> um and similarly they invest money in research because obviously they want to know who not to recruit. If there's a right. way of spotting right. who will be, yeah, if they're not doing it for like any altruistic reasons. Because they, the they want to help people. <laughs> they're doing it because they just want to make sure they don't employ them. Um, so those two sort of interest groups put money into research. So by the 1970s, there's loads of money going into stress research. Hmm. That's where my research kind of, kind of identifies that it really starts to enter into the vernacular and it starts being something that's talked about in the media. But, it, but as I said a, a few moments ago, stress is a lovely vague label to put on a whole range of different experiences. Mm. And one of the reasons it's successful is exactly that, because we can all deploy it in different ways to explain different experiences. Right. It means what you want it to mean in a way. Yeah, it can sort of be used as an excuse for a number of different things or explanation rather than just yeah. excuse. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, yeah, sometimes it is an excuse, but um, that's not to say that yeah. people don't really <laughs> no, feel stressed because yeah. obviously they do. But, you know, it, it becomes a reasonable thing to be signed off work with. Mm. <coughs> and that therefore has an economic cost. Or it's a thing that people might take sick leave for or be absent because they're stressed. That's an economic cost. And when economic costs come into play, then that also brings in interest as well, because companies don't want to have the cost of people who are stressed. Mm. Because could you could we get into quickly as well what the social, particularly from the sort of 70s onwards and particularly going into the 80s, what were the big sort of societal changes that were occurring? If you know what I mean. So to do what with like, created stress. Yeah, I suppose in terms of that, that led to all this sort of writing about stress and how it began. Because I think you, you mentioned as well that the media then started to play a role yeah. as well, or did that become sort of even later? No, I think the media does have a role. I mean, one of the things that the media are doing from the sort of 60s onwards, really, is they're competing with television, if you think about newspapers. Right. Television, oh, course, television yeah. you know, people start to have televisions much more commonly in the 60s. By the time you get to the 70s, most people have got a telly. Newspapers are therefore competing with this intruder into the media landscape. One of the things they do is they start to discuss in newspapers much more openly subjects that have previously been taboo. Such as? Such as things like stress, such as sex. I mean, they've always talked about sex, but they talk about sex in more explicit ways. Oh, things like drugs. So you get you know big shock horror stories about 
mm. those sorts of things because that sells right and stories about terrible medical things that might happen to you or health risks that you might have also sell because people are like oh no i might have that does this sort of link in at all i know this what i'm about to say is more to do with america but it's similar areas was this at all to beginning them with like the kind of war on drugs and the fear on, on, on drugs and that kind of thing on society. And I you think saw... you can see it. I mean, I think you can see links by the time you get to the sort of war on drugs and the whole Reagan era stuff. Mm. It's already well established right. that reporting on ill health works. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at it now, if you look in, in the media, you know, endlessly they are regurgitating very condensed, summarised versions of proper medical and academic research. You know, they'll pick out the top line from, you know, drinking two cups of coffee a day will kill you by the time you're 60. And I'm making it up, obviously, but you know, that kind of thing. Which, yeah, probably there's a paper somewhere that has shown that there's a correlation between drinking right. two cups of coffee and blah, blah. Um, it makes good coffee. It makes easy coffee. So you start to see the media doing more and more kind of ill health stories. Stress becomes for all the reasons that I've already said, something that industry people become more generally interested in, so it gets reported more. You can see it growing through the 1980s. You then develop the stress management industry. How do you deal with stress? Mm. And all these bodies set themselves up. It becomes a commercial thing. Now we can sell stress management training to organisations. Nice. It's really interesting. There's a really interesting parallel going on at the moment. My current research is on menopause history of menopause and menopause has become much more publicly visible in the last few years hugely but it's really interesting there are also a lot more commercial bodies and offers popping up to do with menopause classic one that, that i saw a couple of months ago um, a skincare range that is supposedly selling specific skincare for menopausal women well, it's, it's still skin you know it's right. really there's going to be nothing different in the menopausal skincare from the ordinary skincare. You can get a menopause coach now, apparently. Well, you can get every, you can get like just a life coach now. Well, every, exactly. Everyone has a life but coach. No, it's as targeted. Yeah, 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 as, specifically yeah. for men. You know, so, so there's something interesting, you know, this is capitalism. There right. is something interesting that happens with things like stress, things like menopause, particular human well being and health issues that capitalism taps into. It creates a commercial product because there's a captive audience there, I suppose. So the stress industry develops, particularly from the 1980s onwards, we're now, I think, seeing a nascent menopause industry. And so there's obviously the capitalistic mindset of, it, of people looking to make money for, from stress. You also have, you mentioned the interest from the military out of trying to perform work on the soldiers. What was there, was there also kind of like, uh, you, I read, I remember reading the concern in the work force in general you mentioned of people who seem to, to become more stressed at work than others and there was this debate kind of going on about what is this is this just from the individual or is this more systemic could we go into that a little bit so what... yeah i mean you can see that tension between is it is it is it contextual or is it individual all the way through um the 20th century in my you know the early work on when i looked at nerves in the early part of the century um because you know if you're an employer you don't really want to think that it's the environment and the work that you're giving your worker that's making them stressed because then it's your fault mm. or then you have a responsibility to do something about it. So it's much more preferable for it to be because the actual employee is just weak mm. or unable to cope. Yeah, It makes it much easier if it's the individual's fault because then the individual has to fix it. Right. Rather than up, be upheaving a whole system or... Rather yeah. than trying to change a whole system. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, workplace practices have changed, but they've been forced to change to some extent. Um, the Health and Safety Act in the early 70s, which was mostly targeted at sort of physical health and safety, but actually also included a duty of care to employers around mental health as well. And you start to see that pick up, particularly in the late 20th century, when you start to get legal cases where people take their employer to court, oh, I see. claiming that their nervous breakdown, which meant they had to leave their job, was caused by their employer failing to, to put in place that duty of care. And you start to see successful cases being prosecuted. 
Can you think of any major examples? Uh, I mean, the one that I, the, the one that I, I quoted in, in my research was a guy who, I think it was Northumberland County Council that he won a case against. Uh, I think he might have been a social worker. And basically, you know, he claimed and it was upheld that he had been given an unreasonable amount of work to do without the resource to do it. And therefore, his ultimate stress, nervous breakdown, whatever you want to call it, had been a result. And that it had been flagged up to his employers sufficient times whilst he was still working for them to have had the opportunity to do something about it. And were there any commonalities in terms of the sectors that these kind of complaints used to arise, do you think? Were well, it's interesting. There's a phrase that develops in the 70s and again kind of takes purchase in the 80s, burnout. Right. Um, and it comes from the States and it's initially used to describe people who work in caring professions who can burn out because of the kind of extra emotional empathy that's required in caring professions. And if you do too much of it without sort of support and systems in place to manage your own response, you know, if you're working in a situation where you're dealing with people dying or you know, difficult stuff, um, then this concept of burnout arises, which is where people sort of start to dissociate from their day-to-day -day experience, you know, become depressed, all sorts of things. Um, and I think that burnout idea, I've lost my train of thought. What was the question? Well, it was to do with any, are there any particular sectors that- Yeah, this, sorry. So that, so that, so the idea of burnout particularly can be seen in those caring sectors. So we might think of nurses and doctors particularly, but social workers especially. But also my research, particularly in the sort of 80s, you can see it in the way that reporting on teaching. So a lot of it is public sector workers, interestingly, right. in Britain. I mean, it's not only them, obviously. But a lot of the reporting about stress links to public sector workers. And I think in 1980s Britain, we can connect that to the fact that there were lots of changes going on in the public sector that Thatcher's government was trying to reduce government costs. They were trying to push through various different policies, improvements, efficiency drives, etc. They were changing the nature of the curriculum, changing the nature of teaching. And the response to that by, by a lot of people was that they got stressed. Mm. Or, or they labeled the experiences that they were having as stress. And so lots of the media reporting around them picks up on that and talks about stress teachers, stress social workers, etc. But and do you think it was still very much focused on individual cases rather than oh, in yes. mainstream discourse? It wasn't yeah. addressing the well, systemic. I think it still is. Well, I was gonna. Well, the reason why I was, I was <laughs> going down this road is because a lot of the things we've just been mentioning it just makes me think of what's going on right now with with the NHS, with various workers, yes. with just various industries going on strike. And um, I was going to say, how much do you think really has changed to, since then? Because I, I feel like we like to, I, I've seen in some mentioned discourse that we have sort of come a long way, we've improved a lot. It, it seems quite similar to me, at least, from, on the surface, that we seem, it seems like quite a similar situation today. I think it's an interesting one with stress. You know, the, the, the knowledge is there, the industry is there. Places like the National Health Service are well aware of what stress is and have their stress management processes, etc. But if you think about the experience of the NHS workers during the COVID pandemic, I don't think you could come up with a better example of working under stress for prolonged periods of time, you know, which is partly what's resulting in the industrial action that's being called currently. Um, to draw another parallel, actually, I think to some extent, people have got used to the idea that stress is around and that people get stressed. That's a really good point. In, the way, really in the way that we have been encouraged to get used to the fact that COVID is just there now in our society and we have to get used to it and live with it. And for some people, that just means going back to being completely normal. Mm. For other people, that's much more problematic. And I think in some ways we could draw parallels between COVID and stress. Well, that's such an interesting point because now that you just said that, it kind of well, yeah, it's sort of almost solved. Well, if you're stressed, it means you're working hard, which is good. It means you're doing a, a tough job. It means you're you're working properly. Kind well, of there course. is also there has also been a connection between stress and status as well. Really interestingly, yeah. if you track it, you can track it right back to sort of the nineteenth century, where the idea of being neurasthenic, which was kind of sensitive and stressed in our terms, 
um, or sensitive to stress and overwork was always associated with the middle classes and upper classes. The working man was never stressed mm. because he didn't do brain work, which is obviously rubbish. Of course, they were stressed. They're right. you know, even worse conditions to work in, okay. um, from our perspective, in terms of them being stressed. But, but there's always been this kind of sense of, oh, well, you know, it's only really the, the, the senior executives that get stressed. You start to see that in the 60s. Um, I found about a lovely piece in the, in the Guardian in the 60s about a castle in Wales that was being used as a stress management retreat for senior executives. So it was really expensive. And they got like a week of being pampered and, I don't know, measured and having tests and things. Um, so there is that sense that it's sort of, I must be really important and be doing a really good job if I'm stressed, right. which is obviously quite pernicious and damaging because... It also completely ignores the wider things that go on in people's lives, the, the, well, the also, social circumstances. It ignores those things, but also major research in Whitehall in the um, late 20th century, the Whitehall studies, which were these big cohort studies where they looked at lots of civil servants, they had big groups of them, show that the things that are stressful are lack of control, lack of autonomy, lack of decision making. And those are all factors in low level jobs. Mm. They're not factors in executive jobs. So actually, the things that make people stressed, it isn't really the high flyers. I mean, obviously, yes, some of them do. People get stressed, get stressed everywhere. You get stressed it's, everywhere. Yeah, but actually, if you want to look at it like being systemic, it's the, it's the, it's the really poorly paid, low control, low power jobs that are likely to be stressful. And, it's, and it sounds, um, from all accounts as well, that that period of time with all the different changes in policy that was going on in the sort of 80s, that sort of period, just created complete uncertainty for many people. I mean, uh, to be honest, whenever we discuss this period, I always think of Billy Elliot, the film, that's sort of the first thing that comes to mind. It, just because, to be honest, it's probably, I think, my first, um, just as a child, my first sort of exposure to that era, if you like, and I, that's a good film as well. But but um, I think, that it, but I, I do think it depicts, though, the, the stress and the uncertainty you see in, in his personal life. But um, what you you mentioned the the cases that were taken of of, of um, people being able to take their boss or, their, or whatever to court. How much systemic change really was implemented at the time, and and how much is that discussion? Do you, is that discussion still as prominent today? Do you think in terms of? I mean, there was change, um, and I and I some of my research I kind of tracked it in that you can see organisations starting to put in place stress management. Right. Um, you know, training people, making people aware of it, having policies about stress, about what to do. Um, and you can see the difference sort of from the 80s where they're all kind of like, they're stressed, it's their own fault, to the 90s where it's kind of like, oh, actually, people might be stressed. It's still not about organisations admitting culpability. They're not saying, oh, yeah, we're really sorry, your job is really hard. and It'll take a while for that. It's rubbish yeah. and that makes you stressed. They're still not going to kind of admit that, but, they, but they're going to look at ways in which they can mitigate it and think about it ways of managing it because they need to because it's hitting the bottom line it's an economic problem what ways do you think you can sort of mitigate because obviously it's not about as well on the flip side it's not about saying you should never feel stressed ever because also like you need it yes yeah, stress is how I don't, no it's not like needed but it, well no you do is and it's a sign of doing hard work like you are going to feel stressed sometimes but how can you mitigate the stress do you think well i think it goes it's interesting i haven't really thought about this i think it goes back to what i said earlier about my own life mm. and dividing up work and home life right. or work and other life it's about balance it's always going to be about balance you can work at high stress levels for short periods and sometimes you have to and sometimes you need that stress to get you through deadlines and things of course and that's fine but it's only fine if there's then a downtime if you're trying to work at that high stress level constantly over long periods of time, A, you're going to burn out, back to you know, the definition of burnout, but B, you're going to damage yourself and it'll be unsustainable. And it's that lack of balance that creates the problem. Mm. And I think, you know, there, there are factors that impinge on it. Looking at the research I did around the 80s and the early 90s, people in periods of recession or of unemployment, people are afraid of losing their jobs. So they will turn up and they will try to do that level of high level work all the time because they want to keep their job and they're afraid of losing it. But obviously that's not really sustainable long term. No. Um, and that's, I think, something that still isn't necessarily picked up. 
Well, I, I think, to be blunt, my personal opinion, I think there are a lot of people, particularly in positions of power, high up, who I don't think they're particularly interested in hearing that, that people are stressed. I don't think there's much sympathy. I also think there are a lot of people that strongly associate it with kind of weakness and people complaining. And um, I think, quite frankly, it gets shut down as like a conversation. And what will happen is that uh, they'll take one example of someone who you know, came from a tough background and got it, became a billionaire, and they'll use that to, to as an example for the majority. Well, to be blunt, it's because that person is kind of quite amazing. Quite, you can't expect that to be the norm of everybody. Exactly. But also, individually, we will respond to the same set of circumstances differently at different points in our lives. Mm. So there will be a time when, yeah, I can do X, Y, and Z, and I can work long hours, and I can have loads of pressure on me, and, that, and I can cope with it and fly through it. Yes, there will be periods in my life when I have done that. But there are also times when you just can't do that because other things in your life are different. And the different you're circumstances older, you're born into, whatever. Or you're yeah. less well in some other way mm. that then makes stress an extra burden that your body and your psyche can't cope with. So I think it's 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 difficult. I, I got very uncomfortable sometimes when I was writing my research because I didn't want it to be about the individual. But some of it is about the individual, or at least the individual's circumstances. But some of it is about absolutely institutional and, and environmental stuff. You know, there's a whole interesting set of stuff about the stress of, of living and functioning in particular environments. You know, whether that's to do with lighting or noise or there was interesting research in, in the 60s that I looked at on noise. People wanting to live in houses rather than flats because flats were really noisy. But mm. flats are the obvious solution to a housing crisis because right. you can get a higher density of people into a smaller space. That's really well. That's the thing. I think it always um, just to conclude that bit about stress because I think the misconception is then it, it becomes this thing of either work hard or admit you're stressed, and, and that's not the point at all. It's like there's so much more nuance to it, and that's why I really liked was one of the things I really liked about uh, your article on this. But um, overall, then, what do you think? Why do you think history is an important subject to study? Because there's so much you can tell us and um, what are the benefits have you found through working in this area? Well, I mean, I would say it's important, obviously. It's yeah, well, I don't see <laughs> No, it's just this. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's important because in understanding the past, we can understand the present. Um, you know, I'm wary of saying, oh, you know, if we understand the past, it helps us predict the future because it clearly doesn't. <laughs> and also understanding the past doesn't stop us from making the same mistakes in the future that we've definitely already made not, in the past because we've only got to look at British history in, in recent years to see that um, but I think it makes you it hones your thinking process in very particular ways it makes you very analytical mm. it makes you good at spotting the consequences of things of sort of thinking through a chain reaction if you like so if X happened, then what are the, you know, what are the ripples from X that we can see? And that's quite useful in then thinking about current situations, so like scenario planning. You know, stuff that businesses do when they're planning for disasters. That's the thing where you need to be able to think disaster management. What are the potential ripples of X happening? So like I think, risk assessment. Though. Yeah, it, yeah. And, and, and again, in my corporate life, I, I briefly worked on the disaster management planning for the bank that I worked for, which was fascinating. But I think there are kind of connections, the analytical thought processes of history and the use of evidence, obviously really important in being able to present a case and make an argument and discuss things. So I think understanding the past is important in terms of the skills, the, the skills that history gives us. But it's also about individual identity as well, knowing who we are. Mm. You think, you know, my favourite thing, and I show this to students, and I probably showed it to you when you were here, the stuff in who do you think you are, you know, yeah. the people that turf up on that and they're like, oh, you know, I'm an East Ender born and bred, and then they go back four generations to discover that they're German or something. Mm. And, and the, the way that that messes with people's sense of their identity is one of the reasons that I like to watch it. Um, because... We do, we do ground our own identities in what we think our own family history is or our mm. own lo local or regional history is. And it's, while it's not necessarily at the forefront of your mind every day, it's somewhere in the background of our sense of identity and our sense of being. So I think history has actually, 
it, it's there in a hidden way sometimes in all of our senses of who we are and what we do and why we do it. Oh, absolutely. That's very well said. And um, what do you think is one piece of advice you'd give your younger self? Oh, God. Um, just do it. I was very underconfident when I was younger and very much suffered from imposter syndrome. Um, and there were lots of opportunities that I think I didn't take, that I could have taken because I didn't think I was good enough or I wasn't confident enough to do it. If you don't mind me asking, where do you think that came from? Oh, that, oh that's the thousand dollar question. <laughs> if I knew that, <laughs> I'd sit at my own therapy centre. Um, <laughs> I've thought about it a lot over the years. I think some of it was class. Um, I think some of it was possibly parental. You know, there's a, there's a classic sort of working class, don't get above your station, don't stick out from the norm. Don't, I do feel like the English, we take that to a different level as well. Don't stick do. your head yeah. above the parapet. I think there was an element of that. Um, I also had quite an unusual sixth form um, in that I was the only, back to my weird schooling, I was the only person in the sixth form who wanted to do languages. So I was taught on my own. Wow. That must have been quite good though. You're going to say it's quite good and on paper you think that sounds brilliant. Well you've made to be Think of the downside. Right. It's, <laughs> oh yeah. That's and they tried to get me to change schools, which, wow. was, which was obvious because go to a school where there were other people who were doing languages and I wouldn't because I wanted to do history with the inspirational history teacher hmm. because I knew I would have a brilliant experience of history at A level if I was taught by him. But yeah, I'm, I'm now looking back, the price I paid by being taught individually for languages, perhaps a little bit high. I effectively burned out um, over my A-levels as a result. So I think that contributed then to sort of, as an undergraduate, as a student, having less confidence. And what advice would you give for young people today, in general? Well, probably the same. Yeah, just, just do it. it. Yeah. You know, have confidence. Um, don't feel that you need to get stuck in a particular career. I mean, I just don't think it happens these days. You know, in my dad's generation, you you went to an organisation, you joined them, and you stayed there for life. Right. That's not happened in my life experience. I don't think that happens now. I'm not even sure people expect it. Don't do it. Go and find work that's in play, you know, that's interesting to you. Yes, you need to cover the basics financially, but do something that gets you out of bed in the morning. Mm. Because it's soul destroying if you don't have that. And how, what's, just to finish up, what's your advice in finding something that does get you out of bed in the morning? Because it's not, ah. it's not easy to find that. And as you said, with your own journey, it didn't just turn up overnight. Yeah. What's your advice in finding that? Try lots of things. Try lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did, I had lots and lots of jobs during the 90s. Um, after I'd been in government information or running there for a few years, um, I'd actually moved every two or three years, partly because it was going to different places to see what it was like. I was doing similar-ish work, but just, you know, that experience of working in different places get, gets you that insight. You start to hone what it is that you actually like doing and the kind of place you like working. Mm. Uh, and also the kind of place you don't like working. Right. <laughs> Sometimes really useful to know what that is. Well, look, thank you very much. This has been excellent. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. The links to all your work will be in the description. Please go and check her out. She's fantastic. So thank you Great. very much.